oh, do you think they like me? The narcissist doesn't believe what they're saying there. The, the Scientology, in effect, almost like flicked a narcissist switch with you. Get out there and sing, shoulders back, smash it. All that kind of jazz. Friends, welcome back. Today is a very special day as we are gifted with interview number freaking 11 with HG Tudor. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm very well. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for inviting me back on. Pleasure as always to be talking to you. I really appreciate you coming back on, my friend. And to the audience that um, may be new, uh, what I cover on my channel mostly are cults and my experience growing up in Scientology. And HG Tutor's information when I ran across him in 2016 was absolutely instrumental. And in not only understanding that cults were inevitably run by narcissists, but that my family by dynamic, which we talked about in part one of um, this special uh, series that we're doing, was also cult-like. And the partners that I was attracting, the females tended to be narcissists as well. So this man's information connected a lot of dots. And we've been lucky enough to have him break down everything from cults to Meghan Markle to um, what we're doing now, how narcissistic relationships mirror cults and cult dynamics and vice versa. That's why we have him on, and I feel really lucky because he's provided an incredible amount of knowledge. And if you're on HG's channel, you can find all the interviews we've done as well as interviews that he's done with other people um, on the playlist under interviews. And if you're on my channel, Days But Not Confused, you can find HG Tutor's interviews under Interview with the Narcissist series on that playlist. So what we're going to be talking about today is we're doing a three-chapter it may or may not extend into more episodes, but we're doing three parts about, I explain my experience growing up with my family and how I got stuck into Scientology for a couple decades and then how I got out. And he's, as I said, explaining how, as I explain it, he breaks down what's actually happening. And he went into great detail as we covered my family background in part one about what was going on possibly with my mother and my father and then how my dad got into Scientology and like a cancer or a virus, it then spread to everybody else. So please check out part one to understand what we're going to be talking about in part two, which is the capture and immersion process. So part one is seduction. Part two, we're going to talk about how I actually got into Scientology and what that whole experience was like. And part three is the exit slash escape slash healing process. So do you want me to just pick it up, HG? Um, I'm not going to repeat what we already covered in part one. Do you want me to just pick it up from when yes, I got please. captured? Yes. yes, just do that, Doug. Okay. So um, I was around 19 years old, fresh out of high school. Um, I was a musician, and uh, that's what I wanted to kind of be in my life. So I was told by my parents, basically, that you need to be working a job, going to some kind of schooling, and taking a little bit of Scientology. That was the requirements in my family. So I was a little lost. I already knew I was going to be a, a musician and before that an actor, which I'm sure we'll get into later. And so I wasn't taking school seriously. I was in a vulnerable state, I guess you can say, trying to find my way, which is when a lot of times people can get caught in an abusive relationship and or a cult. So what happened is, is in my family, um, this had, I got caught having to do with marijuana. I'm not going to take up a debate on that. I'm not, you know, pro or anti weed. I'm just telling you what the state of mind was when I actually got into Scientology. So even though my parents were indoctrinating me and that was the philosophy that was going in seed by seed since I was around nine years old, that's when my father got into it. I um, got caught uh, at the, at a place that I was running out for smoking weed, which was a complete no, no not only in kind of society at large at that time, but especially in Scientology. It was indoctrinated into me that all drugs are bad, only Scientology is good. So my parents were away on New Mexico at that time. I had a crisis of faith. I had a decision to make. Do I want to keep being unethical according to Scientology and myself and be doing drugs? Or do I want to take this and stop lying to my parents? Or do I want to take this opportunity to get my shit together, join Scientology, and get what they call putting my ethics in. Again, at this point, I looked up to my parents like they were a god. I was resisting Scientology, but enough cutting down by them and enough indoctrination from Scientology had been in where I was starting to believe this, and it was my fault. So I, after a couple of days of debating, I because I got booted out of this apartment and I could easily tell them, um, I'm going to continue on with my life, make up a bullshit reason, and carry on. But I called them up in New Mexico. 
I said, I joined Scientology because that day I had gone down to say, I'm willing to kind of get my shit together and, and become like a contributing member of society. And I think Scientology is the way to do it. They were ecstatic. They couldn't believe it. And from that point forward, I fell under the spell and I was a 100% dedicated Scientologist. That's the real brief story, HG. Did you want to jump in and say anything on that? Certainly. So when you got caught on the Gange, when you were smoking a big blunt there, my man, <laughs> um, who was it who basically said you need to get your shit together? Because your parents were in New Mexico. So who was it that was putting you under that pressure? You. Yes, because of the indoctrination. Like I said, there at that time, this would have been like the 80s, I guess, maybe early 90s. I don't know. Um, there was the societal stigma, right? It was illegal at the time. Now HGI can order an ounce, you know, no problem legally and have it here in 30 minutes. So the climate was different. But man, in Scientology, the one thing you are not allowed to do is smoke pot, LSD, no drugs. I think part of that, my man, is to prevent the programming from going in. Again, I'm not promoting weed. I'm just saying I think I would have been less susceptible. My mind would have, I, I think I would have been able to see through the bullshit. Mm -hmm. And another reason for that is that what they claim is you can't get case gain. I'm not going to go into the terminology, but you can't get spiritual gain if you're not honest and open. And part of being um, not honest and open is I'm a drug user. So drugs were very, like the equivalent of, of my parents finding out that I smoke weed was being a heroin addict in Scientology, just to put it into perspective at how serious okay. that was and how guilty I felt. But the interesting thing is that at this time you were being indoctrinated into Scientology by your parents but it wasn't sufficient to stop you from going off and smoking weed of itself. The threshold moment was the fact that you got caught. Yes. So it wasn't enough to keep you from doing it in itself, but there was almost seems like it offered some kind of savior aspect to you that I've fallen from grace, not so much because I'm smoking drugs, but shit, I've been found out. Who caught you? It was the guy that I was staying with. He was like this 70 year old man who would chain smoke and every night he would just cough, cough, cough. And so when I moved in, he said, you can smoke, you can do anything you want, um, but you cannot do drugs, especially weed. So this was an older gentleman who, and by the way, HG, I know he smelled it. What I would do is I would take big bong rips and then I'd open up the window and I would blow it out. But his place was next door. He was guaranteed to have smelled it months before he called me out. So I think it took him a little bit of courage to finally say, look, kid, I told you you can't freaking smoke weed in here. I found the bong under the bed, and it's time to boot you out. So I was a man without a country and very vulnerable at this moment. So Plus, he, I was he, he, he didn't pick up on the fact that you were talking shit regularly and, and chomping down on chocolate brownies. Hey, man, I was a professional stoner. I could keep my shit together, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So he finds out that you're uh, uh, smoking marijuana and then says, basically, you can't do that. You're out. Yes. Which then presumably meant that you would have to do some explaining to your parents as to why you don't live there any longer or why exactly. you need to come back home, et cetera. Exactly. So at this point, your programming kicked in to say, don't worry, I'll save you, submit to the Scientology, and all will be well. Yeah. So it's interesting that it shows the power that it had, that nobody came along to you and sort of said, hey, Doug, and put their arm around your shoulder and said, look, you've been a wayward boy here, and, you know, before you get, uh, you know, marijuana's a gateway drug, and before you turn into an extra from train spotting, I want to take you under my wing and protect you such as the level of programming that goes on that you did it for yourself albeit yeah. there had to be a trigger moment there had to be a trigger of loss namely your accommodation and some potential shame associated with that as well of saying to your parents i've been caught out smoking drugs etc and of course as you know not only was the societal stigma as you've uh, referenced the fact was that within scientology circles this was not a done thing so i should imagine the empathic aspect of you also would be concerned about the effect that it might have on your parents in terms exactly. of them feeling shame for your conduct. Exactly. So all of this created a maelstrom within the mind of Doug, which was, I've uh, committed a major boo-boo here, but also part of your mind then said to you, don't worry, 
you can sort this out by submitting to Scientology, which just shows uh, the power that it has. It's almost like the most powerful narcissist that you would meet. But yeah. it didn't actually have to be there talking to you. So exactly you know, right. if, we, if you draw the analogy with the narcissist, the narcissist didn't have to be there saying to you, wagging a finger saying, Doug, you terrible human being, but don't worry, I'll save you. I'll stop you, you know, getting on the devil's dandruff and all of that. I'll keep you on the, the right track. It was so powerful that, that seed had already been implanted in you so that you got there yourself, which is exactly. quite remarkable. HG, real quick on that. I was just doing an interview yesterday with um, an ex-Scientologist. We were talking back and forth about that very point. Mm -hmm. There was nobody. I was a public member in Scientology, and there's people that work full-time, and they sign these ridiculous metaphoric billion-year contracts that work 24-7 for the organization. So it's understandable how they would be able to be kept under control because they're in and around the mind control environment. But remember, mm -hmm. I was a public member. And this is how powerful the programming is and why I think Elrond created a very clever trap step by step, boiling a frog in hot water to get me up to this point, not even resisting Scientology. I didn't realize how much, like you said, it had gone in my mind. Mm. So I was just talking about this yesterday with this guy that no one was following me around. No one was preventing me from looking at negative information online. I mind controlled myself. I did it all myself. So that's the power of what you just were describing about the programming and not even realizing just how powerful that had already taken hold, even not being a dedicated Scientologist yet at all. I mean, as you know, what one of the uh, most effective manipulations with somebody is to make them think that it's their own idea. Exactly. So this is what Scientology has done to you. And it's what narcissists will do is what I've done right. with, is make them believe that the thing that they're going to do, they arrived at of their own volition. It's That's far so more powerful uh, because ensuring that somebody does something uh, consensually, getting their buy into it is far more powerful than uh, at the end of the day, the utilization of threat and physical violence and sexual violence will bring about compliance. But there are issues with that. There are many people mm -hmm. that automatically rail against it yeah. because they see it for what it is. This is a clear and present threat to me. Whereas a much more subtle approach of suggesting to somebody that how about uh, you talk about it and let, and let them join the dots so that they feel like it's their idea, that they feel like they're the one that's had the accomplishment. And you basically allow themselves to open up the bear trap themselves and step yes. right into the middle of it and then set it off and go, that's okay because uh, I chose to do all of this. Of course, yes. they don't realize they've walked into a bear trap. Yes. You, uh, one does by allowing them to get to that point. But it's a particularly powerful way of ensuring that manipulation is so effective that you submit wholly to it because you're the one that thought of it exactly can i ask you two questions on that real quick because that's a great point first of all i always said if my parents were and or the cult leader were beating me that would have been far easier to see and recover from it was because it was invisible i was doing it to myself and like you said i walked into a bear trap it's that psychological manipulation minus any warning signs any being beat that really fucked me up when I was trying to work this out coming out of it. And again, that's why your information was so pertinent to putting together a lot of dots in one shot. And this, the question I wanted to ask you, man, since you're a professional at this, what are some of the techniques that you would use or how would you explain it where you got someone to do their own bidding, their own thinking, thinking that, that it's their own thing? Because that's the key, what you just said. Mm -hmm. Well, chief amongst doing that would be to... <clears throat> understand that person and what makes them tick so i've actually been doing some videos um, about this with regard to understanding people's views in relation to death so that's just one aspect it's called the ease of control the videos mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm i'm doing a whole different set on, on them at the moment i'm focusing on people's attitudes and emotions associated around death so awesome wow it could be about that i'll be doing another one which is about the way that human beings operate within loops they just keep repeating the behaviors yes, yes. and so the starting point is essentially know thy enemy which is or know the victim so to understand what that person what makes that person tick and what concerns them what they would buy into and that concern 
has to be at an emotional and visceral level. So you can find that out, for instance, by looking at their social media, by having a conversation with them, by talking to friends about them. But finding you know, a, a common one would be that an empathic person is very much into looking after animals. And that's a very good pressure point in relation to them that they care about animals and are concerned about their welfare. In other instances, it might be concerns about the well-being of a family member. But whatever it is, it's about finding that relevant emotion and those thoughts and feelings that cause the individual to light up. And then one feigns an interest in that to say, oh, yes, I'm in the canine defence legal, so you know, I really want to ensure that Rover. And then by getting that buy-in so that they think that you're similar to them and that you have similar interests, and what's also important is to remember this, that as getting them to do that thing, you want to focus on the doing rather than the not doing which again is related to this concept of it being their own idea, because the human brain is designed to do, it doesn't like rejection or being told not to do something. It can't program, it can't function with regard to it. So an example of this would be, if I was to say to you, don't think of pink elephants. Whatever you do, I don't want you to think automatically you're thinking of a pink elephant because your brain w won't process that negative uh, instruction. So the way instead for you to successfully avoid thinking about a pink elephant is to do something positive and think about a green rabbit instead. And so if you think about the green rabbit and keep thinking about the green rabbit, you are no longer thinking about it. It's a similar way that... If you were skiing down a hill and you don't want to hit the trees, you're in an alpine environment, you're thinking, don't hit the trees, don't hit the trees. What do you end up focusing on? The trees. When what you should really be telling your brain is focus on the gaps, focus on the gaps. So then you focus on those gaps and you ski down. So similarly with manipulating somebody, if you keep saying to them, don't do this, don't do that, they're actually not programmed to accept that. And it takes a lot more effort and application so what you do is you focus on how about we do this and how about we do that and find identify something that's positive, that's linked to what they're interested in doing and what matters to them and that you show that you're interested in it. So you then become a trusted partner of that individual. And then because you're seen as a trusted partner, what you can then suggest is whatever it is that you're actually aiming at but allow them to come around to thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm into that as well because I want to stay alongside this person. So it's about ingratiating yourself, but not arse licking, but by ensuring that one identifies something that really matters to this person, hijacking that to demonstrate that you are of the right caliber and therefore to be trusted, and then starting just like almost like pebbles in a lake just dropping them in there so those concentric circles uh, all join up with one another so that they formulate the idea of this is going to be a good thing so it's getting on side with them uh, accentuating the positive dropping in the small ideas rather than trying to give them the, the the big sell and then in the circumstances they're more much more amenable and they will feel that they've got there although you've led them you've they are the one that joins the dots and therefore that becomes much more powerful because ultimately they then yeah. believe that it was their idea because yeah. again the memory is treacherous and they will like the idea of thinking yeah i came up with this idea it was it was my uh, it was my process and therefore you've got ownership of it and also remember empathic people have a considerable sense of obligation and responsibility yes. So if you are the one that's essentially come up with the idea, you you regularly own it. We can walk away from things at the drop of a hat, as you know, exactly. for, for you guys. So similarly, where you've been indoctrinated and your own mind says to you, here's a way out, you then end up owning that and thinking, well, given the fact that that's providing me with a way out, I essentially have gratitude for it. And I utilize that in the same way with 
what I provide to people, I provide gratis hundreds, if not thousands of blog articles, knowing that people will feel a sense of obligation for having got that free material from me, but they're more likely to then want to engage in my paid services because they think I've got all of this free information for this guy. I feel a little bit bad, really, that I've kind of been taking from him. So um, I'm going to book. I don't. Uh, I don't have a problem now with booking uh, this detector with him or purchasing these things from the Knowledge Vault. I think it's only right. Uh, but it's a win-win because, of course, they get the information. I was going to say, is there anything wrong with that particular thing? Would you consider that a manipulation? I mean, I know you would be doing it from that perspective, but there's nothing wrong with what you just described. There, well, nobody's there? being defrauded, are they? Because exactly. you're exactly. you're paying for you're paying for something and you get a product. But again, notice yeah. how it, it became their idea. So interesting. I, I created interesting. this body of work yeah. you're getting for free, and knowing the way that empathic people think, yes. I know. That some of them, not all, but many of them will feel and think, I've he's answered these questions for me on the blog. I've I've got all of this reading out of him. I really ought to buy something by, by way of showing kind of thanks. Thank you very yes. much. I, and it's your idea. I didn't force you. I didn't say sure. to you, you must now go and buy. Will the narcissist use the sex tape against me? You got there yourself. That's true. It's very clever, man. I mean, marketers use that as well too, right? Indeed. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the, the lost leader is the common way of doing it, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and so, but it's about knowing that individual because some people right. they will take they will take for nothing again and again and again. Sure, a narcissist, know. right? Uh, or they can or can be normals as well. You're right; there'll be narcissists, but empathic people are more likely because of their sense of decency and honesty to think to themselves, "Well, I've got all of this. It's only right that I return something." Exactly. Exactly. You know, when you were describing that, I had so many flashbacks of what was happening to me in the cult. There was a, there's a registrar posted at every Scientology church. And that's the person who tries to squeeze as much money out of the person as they can and mm -hmm. sell them the quote unquote bridge to total freedom. That's the route that you're trying to sell in Scientology to people. It's really expensive. Mm -hmm. Yet the person that was selling me was so convinced themselves and so mind controlled and under the spell themselves they didn't feel like they were manipulating, even though this particular registrar I'm thinking of, his name was Jim Hamry, RIP. Mm -hmm. He got hundreds of thousands of dollars out of my family. He squeezed endless amounts of money out of me and my time and everything else, and all under the guise of caring. It was all fake, now that you pointed out, and I look back at it. Mm -hmm. It was all, it seemed so real because of, like I said, he believed in Scientology. And once that mind is captured, we then feel compelled because of the programming to prophetize and get other people in. So mm -hmm. it was a split personality with us in general. And this guy that I'm talking about, this registrar, because while he both really believed in Scientology and, you know, you could mortgage your house to sit for spiritual freedom. We're taught that's the most important thing. Everything else is secondary. So he had that juxtaposed against Behind the scenes, he was constantly um, under pressure from people that were attacking him because he caused them to mortgage their house. He got them in endless debt. He kind of mm -hmm. put them un under a little bit and got all their money. And then they, when they go, what the hell did I just do? My, my wife's going to kill me for what just happened. He yeah. caused all kinds of problems. And then he'd have to keep that under wraps while dealing with me. So I had no idea or very little about the pressure and the shenanigans that he was faced by committing this fraud. And yet yeah. he would say simultaneously that he really believed it. There's a phrase called the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics in Scientology. A human translation is it's all for the greater good. So we're getting rid of people's uh, what's called reactive minds. This is a thing. Well, in science. You, if I can just jump in there. Sure, there. please. One of the things that you see there is, is with this gentleman who was causing people to part with huge sums of money and the way that it's done. Um, with Scientology and also other forms of religion, we only have to look at these uh, very wealthy evangelists who, yeah. who uh, you know, are flying around in private jets, etc. Exactly. Uh, and people remark, why on earth are people giving away this money? Because both Scientology and those uh, other types of uh, evangelical organizations you, uh, tap into this concept of the, the of you being saved, of your mortality, the fact that you. Uh, need to find some kind of salvation and ordinarily uh, human beings when they uh, because we're the only species that has a contemplation of the inevitability of our expiration dogs don't cats don't 
crocodiles don't. I know there's some people, HG, that just real, that would actually argue that, that dogs actually kind of do know a few days before they're about to pass, but the point's taken. Yeah, I don't okay. know if that's true or not, but I, that, I well, just I can already hear the comments, man. <laughs> okay, well, leaving aside uh, Rover's ability to recognize his impending doom, we'll park that, but with a human being... Uh, they have uh, a human being is aware that at some point you're going to die. So it's as Depeche Mode's recent, the most recent album, Memento Mori, remember you're going to die. And religion taps into that because you have two ways of dealing with it. You have a proximal defense, which is basically, oh, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to distract myself with uh, easy women, cheap liquor and drugs. So I don't have to contemplate it. And that's approximate defense. But a better one is a distal defense, which basically gets at the issue in your subconscious. And there are various distal defenses. But one of those is a complete belief in the validity of your particular outlook on the world and the values associated with that. And that's where religion and Scientology come in so that they create a distal defense for you in your subconscious so that you basically um, don't have any concern about what's going to happen to you because you are going to be saved. You are among the chosen. You know, it's funny that you bring that up because and I'm sure we'll get into this as we head towards part three in the future. My dad just passed and he was at on March 1st, 2023, mm -hmm. um, RIP, because I have a lot of sympathy for him despite you know, forgive them for they know not what they do with my with my pops. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother, we've been communicating a little bit via email, and she said what a typical Scientologist said, and one of the hardest things to give up in Scientology when I got out is you have a protection mechanism against death. If you know you're immortal, and that's what Scientology not mm -hmm. only sells, but you go into past lives and you get your memory back, all of which is false uh, is false implants actually being put into your mind. Yeah. But um but if you believe in that, it's such a sell. Religion's such a sell. If you got the afterlife covered, if you, I don't think anybody really, I mean, maybe near-death experiences will claim they know. I don't know. I've never had one. But I'm saying if you can convince yourself or really know that the afterlife is covered, that is a very, very powerful thing. So when my dad passed and my mom was sending me a couple of emails, she's really hurting and I feel really bad for her. But she has this fail-safe mechanism that I'm going to meet up with your dad shortly. I told him to wait for me. You know, um, it's okay. Now that sounds kind of beautiful in a certain way, but I got to tell you, my man, it desensitizes death. And I, all the feelings for my friends passing and stuff when I was in Scientology was no problem. I never cried. Only when I got out of the cult, thank God, my emotions hit me and death affects me. I'm probably more sad of my dad who I haven't, you know, seen for a decade because Scientology split us up then maybe yeah. my own mom is. Maybe not, but I'm just saying I could feel the desensit desensitization from my mother. I'm not minimizing her hurt, but I'm just saying that is such a powerful sell. No wonder religions sell people. And who, who, doesn't, who doesn't want to know that? You know what I mean? Well, precisely. It goes back to the point that we are all, uh, we're all going to expire at some point. Mm -hmm. We're all going to die. And uh, as I've explained, that that's a, for me, that's a threat to my control. So I don't fear death. I don't fear the process of dying. I've had numerous really? brushes with the Grim Reaper already and came, came away from it without uh, without too many problems. Um, but because of the way that I'm constituted, I, I'm neither... I, I'm At best, I'd be irritated by the fact that it's prevented me from achieving what I need to achieve. But it doesn't upset me. It doesn't make me anxious. And so, but for most people, the prospect of death and knowing that you're going to die, um, you might not pay much attention to it in your 20s. As you get older, it becomes an increasingly, uh, it becomes increasingly a matter of concern. And that's the big sell for any of these outfits that are religious or religious based is to offer some sort of salvation, afterlife or immortality with the case of Scientology. And it, it, it taps into that distal defense. And it's so crucial because one of the most base emotions that people have is fear. And fear of death is probably the most prevalent emotion that exists for human beings. So if you can come along and immerse somebody, as the way that Scientology does, by saying, I will protect you from the most 
visceral, basic, and widespread emotion that affects humanity, who's not who's who's going to say no to that? Especially when they hypnotize you and convince you of that through suggestions. It's kind of like a narcissist whispering when you're most yeah. suggestible all throughout Scientology. It's really set up to keep you in a suggestible state where not only do you believe that it becomes your reality because it's implanted deeply in the subconscious. You know what I yeah. mean? Well, you, you've been immersed because it was your idea to go in there. Exactly. And, and therefore human beings are programmed only to do things which they think are a good idea. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if you say, or you know, for instance, you've got a child and the child's moved to the city and they keep saying, you know, Pa, will you send me some money? You know, I'm finding it difficult here. You know, uh, I need more money to survive. And the father's thinking, my God, I'm sure he's spending it on wine, women and song. Um, but he still sends it anyway. Why? Because notwithstanding his uh, misgivings about it, he fundamentally believes that it's an appropriate and right thing to do. He thinks it's a good idea. No human being ever at the time they make a decision goes, this is a stupid idea, because if you did, you wouldn't do it. And so it goes back to this power of the immersion you've experienced, whereby you thought it was a good idea. And therefore, you also don't like to admit to yourself later on maybe I didn't quite make a good decision there. There's a lot of that kind of self-validation of, no, 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 it was the right thing to do. And so you want to make it work. So even if after a period of time, you might have started to have doubts about it, you, you've got, first of all, it was your idea, which is very powerful. It's offering this distal defense to you, which is a subconscious level, subconscious level is hugely powerful. It's offering you a way forward and also to attract the uh, confirmation and validation from your parents, which you said they were ecstatic when you contacted them. And, you know, you're being the good son. Uh, you're not a, not a bad human being, so you want them to be happy also. And at the same time, you're getting these repeated whisperings of, do it, it's the right thing, you're, you're, you're doing the right thing here. So all of those things mean that you are drowning in effect of these forms of manipulation from both within and externally. So you didn't stand a chance but be utterly and thoroughly immersed. Thanks for breaking that down. I had several realizations again while you were talking about just why this thing worked because I've been beating myself up a bit. As much as I understand and I'm still learning about how the quote unquote trap works, it mm -hmm. is it did seem like I it's hard to get across to people how real that illusion was, but when you lay out the elements like that, it's completely understandable why I would believe that, especially since it's coming from my own mind and supposedly my own ideas, not knowing anything about manipulation or suggestion or any of that. Plus my parents are into it. Tom Cruise and John Travolta are into it, which mm -hmm. leads into the next part, um, HG. So now I'm in, right? They love bomb me. They tell me I'm super special. I'm an immortal being. We're the top 10% of the people on the planet, according to Scientology, if we find Scientology, because we had the sense enough to subconsciously seek it out. So they're constantly boosting up the ego once you buy into it. You have a whole environment of people that really do want to see you do well because the staff member statistics will go up the better you do in life. So everybody's motivated to help everybody else. Nobody's really in on a secret and lying to each other we're all manipulated to manipulate other people. So I wanted you to break this down and maybe help explain this a little bit because being in this narcissistic environment, there was some benefit in the way of this. I always wanted to be an actor since I was a kid. My, I told my parents I want to move to Hollywood when I was 14. I saw a movie called Stand By Me with River Phoenix. River okay. Fe When I was 12 years old, he blew my mind and I knew instantly it was like a realization what I was going to try to do. My parents said, wait till you get out of high school, then you can do it. So I got out of high school. I said, mother and father, now can I go to Hollywood? Son, you need to get a job, go to community college or college and go do some Scientology. So this kept getting put off and then I became a musician. But in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be an actor. I felt like that's what I could develop and be good at. Mu music, I had to work hard at. It didn't come naturally, but this was, like I said, a revelation when I was, when I was young. So one of the things that happened is around 20, maybe 21 years old, I was in an auditing session. Um, that's basically their psychotherapy without going into too much detail. It's where they hypnotize you, access your subconscious and in general implant false memories. But every once in a while you can tap into something. So I was in a session one day 
And I, I just had what they call a rekindled purpose while I was under this light trance state. And I said, I wanted to be an actor. That's what I want to do. Now, Scientology off, all, also had many tools that were seemed to help actors. There's a thing called the communication course where we'd read lines from Alice in Wonderland and we'd act out at various different emotional states, sad, happy. It, they were drills that almost seemed tailor-made and this cult almost seemed tailor-made for my goals anyways. So mm -hmm. once I, I babbled to my auditor, you know, session after session about this new revelation, I broke up with the girlfriend, sold the landscape company, got my first extra job um, in a movie um, okay. within a month, and then moved out to Hollywood. So minus Scientology, I would have never rekindled that failed purpose. I never would have had the confidence to move out to LA, even though it was an hour away, because I knew they had a celebrity center where I was going to meet like-minded people. I promise you, I did not have the confidence, minus the placebo effect, because that's what I look mm -hmm. at it now, of Scientology instilling the love bombing, the confidence. I'm special. I'm an immortal being. Of course I could make it as an actor. Yeah. Mind you, I had no idea what was really going to happen, but the placebo effect, the confidence, the love bombing, I'm special. That yeah. And then the realization in session, oh, I'm going to be an actor. I don't know if I would have ever thought of that. I probably would have just kept mowing lawns for the rest of my life. So in a weird way, being in the Scientology environment did inspire a it was a false self, self sense of confidence, but nonetheless, it actually made me live out my dreams. What would you say to accidental gains or maybe a, a fake bolstered sense of self-confidence being in said narcissistic relationship might actually produce some quote unquote benefits? Do you know what I'm talking about? I certainly do. And in fact, what you, what happened there was that it, it, they didn't turn you into a narcissist because you, you are not one. They got and close. As an, adult, as an adult, you can't become one. Exactly. But in effect, what they did was give you a suit of armor, which was caused you to take on certain attributes in a way that a narcissist does. So you can think of many mediocre sports people, many mediocre pop stars, actors, and they think they are the bee's knees. They think they really are the top shit. Why? Because inside, the, in their head, there is a record playing telling them you are the best. You are special. These people should be worshipping you. Exactly what you were being told. So that, what they're hearing is their narcissism reminding them that they're in the, they are the elite. They are top dog. They are superior, brilliant. These people are here to listen to you. And Many performers have to have that to an extent, but their cap what, what they do is they have to remind themselves of these people are here to to listen to me, so don't be nervous about singing in front of them. So they are able to deal with potential stage fright by reminding themselves that act of uh, metacognition, standing to one side and going, look. It's not a hostile audience. They're, they've paid money to come and listen to you. You're dealing with people who like you. So what are you worrying about? Get out there and sing, shoulders back, smash it, all that kind of jazz. Now, narcissist doesn't enter their mind. They might say, oh, do you think they like me? The narcissist doesn't believe what they're saying there. They're, what's happening is they're just saying it to someone to get that person, to, oh, darling, they'll, they'll think you're amazing. So that person is under control and provides them with fuel. But that narcissist has that voice in their head saying to them, you are numero uno, you are the grand fromage, you can sing like nobody else can sing, these people worship you. And so the, the Scientology, in effect, almost like flicked a narcissist switch with you to imbue you with a level of self-confidence, which wasn't your natural state of being, that imbued you with a sense of purpose, that ordinarily you wouldn't have had with a sense of inflated ability and perception of who you are. And of course, the game for you is you got out there and you did something that you enjoyed. So ultimately, that in itself, if, if we were to compartmentalize it, isn't such a problem. But of course, as you know, you can't just have that little chunk of the positive of Scientology. It's the same way that when dealing with many narcissists, many narcissists are fascinating people, great fun to be about, hilarious, uh, interesting, exciting. But we all know all of the shit 
that comes with all of that. And you can't have one without the other. And so similarly for you, you could compartmentalize that positive impact of, of uh, flicking that switch to enable you to achieve your dreams, which Scientology helped you do, bravo, but it comes with a cost, as you know full well. Exactly. Really well said and really well articulated. I'm glad that you said that because, yeah, I don't want to encourage anybody to go into Scientology thinking they're going to get a break into Hollywood or that's going to boost up their confidence, and that's enough. You described it perfectly with the, with the abusive relationship. Because well, it's, it's interesting, mm -hmm. sorry to cut across you, Doug, but it's interesting, no, no. Uh, for, for instance, with the cruiser. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a man who is, you know, perfect example. Yeah, hyper focused, yep. you know, absolute single purpose in the way that yep. he about things. And that's why Scientology suits him. It's oh, an yes. absolute fix for him because he's already got that record saying, You are the one that's going to undertake this stunt. And you can not only will you do it once, you'll do it six times. I've spoken recently uh, about how uh, in Norway, he, well, he started off in Britain on the back of a uh, motorbike, and he must have done a hundred, several hundred of these jumps. And he did it without a speedometer. He sensed it through the rhythm of the motorbike wow. and the vibrations over and over again, almost like creating muscle wow. memory. Mm -hmm. And then he took the jump to this huge scaffold in Norway and flew off end. And he didn't do it once. He did it six times. I know. The guy's amazing. Yeah. Now, to be able to do that, he has that hyper focus that exists yeah. that's telling him that not only does he want it to be perfect, but that he is such a superlative actor and human being that he doesn't need a stuntman, that he'll jump off this building and smash his ankle and he'll still finish the shot. Yep. On all of that. And on one level, one can hugely admire that. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy his films, but it shows what a, what a fit he is for Scientology. Exactly. And that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut yeah. across you. Because, it, because it, it, it fits in with how he sees himself. Scientology on purpose definitely inculcates that, and it's extreme on what you just said. You can make anything go right. You can do anything you set your freaking mind to. And they, he, it is a perfect fit for Tom Cruise. I often wonder... How much of that is Scientology and how much of that, if he was a psycho, if he is a psychopath, was already or narcissist, was already there to begin with? It's I can't tell with him. It is already there to begin with. Definitely on that HG. I'm sure you're right. I, I just was already to, he he hasn't been influenced essentially with the fundamental character traits of who he is by Scientology. It's I basically it's a, a marriage of interesting. He's like that anyway and the essential tenets of that organization fit perfectly with yes, who he is. Do. Thanks for clearing that, clarifying that and saying that out loud because I've always figured that, but um, it's good to hear you validate that too. Because yeah, he seems like he was already a narcissist. And if you look back at his early days, he already had traits of that well before Scientology. And then along comes Scientology, boosts up his ego, and then again, it would just add to his drive to do everything because they teach mm -hmm. you that you can be perfect. Yeah. So he's never getting out, man. And even if he did HG, like, so he would, since he's a narcissist, he would just be using Scientology. In other words, what, in other words, what does he get out of it? Right. For me, it was more like feeling guilty and this and that. It would be a different experience for a narcissist in a cult like that, wouldn't it? Because in order for him to extract himself, wouldn't it almost be impossible because he's getting so much out of it? He gets free Absolutely. slave labor. He gets uh, it, boosted it, up. I mean, he gets everything. It, it, it's telling him exactly what he wants to hear. Exactly. Maybe you are immortal. You are amazing. <laughs> Literally. So, yes. Although he already believes this, he's existing in an echo chamber. Exactly. And he, it enables him to hold certain cachet within the organization as well because of his status, et cetera. So it's it's almost like he's met himself and he's exactly. said to himself, you're great. No, you're great. No, you're great. No, you're great. So true. The question was, to, will he ever get out? And I said, no, because there's, there's no actual need for him to do so because it fits perfectly with what he is. It reinforces and tells him what he is. It tells him what he wants to hear. It, in a way, Scientology hasn't really had to seduce him exactly he seduced he, himself he, yeah he has gone there and, and basically you you're the organization i've always been looking for because you fit with what i am that's why exactly. people like him run that organization in the first place 
Exactly. That organization Even, is an extension of their mindset and attitude. Right. Even though I lost the kind of train of thought that you triggered, it'll probably come up later. Um, you know, it is interesting that that you drove home a point that I just wanted to hammer home here because I don't, like I said, I don't want anybody running out thinking this is a good thing. Mm. The okay, here's what it was. What Tom Cruise is missing, and what I was missing when I was in the cult, is how you come across to other people. That reality gap between what's really true and your real behavior that other people can suss versus what you think is going on inside your mind. This mm. is the most embarrassing part, HG, about getting out of Scientology and why it crushed my ego and I had to be put down to size. Because yeah. I realized that my friends, who I would try to sell Scientology on sometimes, and my whole behavior... Even though it might have helped in the audition rooms, it caused me to have the confidence to move out. There is a price to pay with this freaking thing that far outweighs. And looking back at it, I didn't need any of that because I have the self-confidence minus that. You know, the whole experience taught me a lot. So you don't need any abusive relationship, like you said. You don't need to thank your abuser and you don't need to get stuck in this for life lessons. But I can't take it back. I'm glad that it caused me to go out to Hollywood and everything. But that could have happened anyways. And the price that I paid, the come down of the high, um, was so, I'm still recovering it from it 15 years later. It wasn't worth it. And I could have made that happen anyway. So what Tom Cruise fails to, he may have all the money in the world. And he, like you said, he's a mirror looking at himself. And Scientology is that mirror telling him constantly how great he is. But his ability to recognize how foolish he comes across to other people, the diatribe that he, you know, did on television with Matt Lauer about, you know, he went overboard on anti-psychiatry, his whole yeah. behavior, he doesn't realize that he looks like a complete jackass and dipshit to people like me and a lot of other people that aren't under the movie star spell. I know yeah. a lot of people will put that aside and they'll debate and they'll go, no, he's not a narcissist. Who cares? He's kick ass. Can you fucking do that motorcycle stunt? You know, there's all these things they could justify about what a badass he really is. Yeah. But be, that's all facade, man. Behind that, I he's a scared little boy or whatever, he, whatever that narcissist is. He talks about his trauma, actually, about how he wanted to be a preacher. And he had a, you know, his dad, I think, used to beat the shit out of him. He had a ter terrible mm -hmm. father. So he was already set up to become, to overdo it. But he mm -hmm. did, like, I, my point is, is we don't realize, uh, and, and it doesn't register just how you know stupid we, we really do come across and is there any way that tom cruise could a narcissist like him would they have to remove something that was important to him would they have to cut him down some way what would it take for him to actually get out of scientology is there any chance of him breaking the spell if it doesn't become beneficial for him at some point it would only be where he would deem that the organization is of no further use to him I see. so if he saw that it was not catering to his needs, then he would reject it because that would then amount to a threat to his need for control. Mm -hmm. But it, at the moment, it does attune with precisely what he requires. Yeah. But if in some way they started to not provide him with what he required, cause him to have to do certain things which weren't in, in accordance with the prime aims, etc. Uh, it would not if it the narcissist only tolerates it where it uh, serves the prime aims. Interesting. It then ultimately, it'll be jettisoned. This is a question I've been dying to ask you based on that. So this might be the difference between because I thought about this with my parents, my mother in particular. Mm. If she, um, who I consider a narcissist, and Tom Cruise, another narcissist, left Scientology. They wouldn't necessarily go through what I went through where I felt bad. I had to be brought down to size. I had to deprogram myself. Wow, look at my behavior. I thought all these false ideas that were boosting up my ego, and actually none of these ideas turn out to be true. If Tom Cruise extracted himself, it would be a different experience, would it not? Like he would say, something's wrong with Scientology. I'm leaving because David Miscavige didn't give me the power that I thought I had. In other words, it would be self-serving. He wouldn't sit there and have a breakdown and go, oh, oh wow, I abandoned my kid. I should. He would never self-introspect, right? No, I mean he might wow. he might say, for instance, goodness me, how awful. Well, I, I don't think he would, but somebody else might say, for instance, I abandoned my child, how terrible. But that's what Scientology made me do, i.e. immediate blame see. shifting. I it see he wouldn't take responsibility. It wasn't my fault. In some instances, it would simply be, No, you know, what what a ridiculous organization. And of course, many people that come out the other side, what they have to do is demonstrate that, oh gosh, you know, I was I was indoctrinated and so forth. 
so forth. Now, that is true, that is the case, mm -hmm. but where a narcissistic psychopath comes out the other side of it would, uh, would basically turn around and say, yeah, it was the organization was the problem, not me. Exactly. See, that's why I never put myself back in my parents' hands. And normally in Scientology, when you speak out like I do, they call you a suppressive person. And that means my parents can have no contact with me. Yeah. They still, um, ha I've had a little bit of contact via email over the last decade and, and however long it's been, but it's what they call in Scientology, good roads, good weather. We can't talk about anything too deep. It has to be surface level stuff. And only if it's something that business oriented that we have to talk to each other. Yeah. But norm, so I had to kind of break with them, HG, and it had to do with coming across your information because I was always going back into the snake's den. I was always getting sucked back in by the vipers, man. It's like yeah. very subtly because they could only think as Scientologists and or narcissists. They would always, not even being aware of it, need to uh -huh. get me back into the cult or at least under their control. And I think the reason they even keep any communication or have my mother, because my father passed recently, is simply to keep the control. So, oh man, it's just That's amazing, right. right? An organization such as a cult, invariably, the, the, the head of it, there will be a narcissist. Mm -hmm. There will be, because a cult is a means of controlling people by filling their heads with false information, either making them believe that they are beholden to another person for some reason, that they're special, that something amazing is going to happen, mm -hmm. and it's all about control. Now, the... Interesting thing is that in terms of the victims of that cult, it will include both empathic individuals who are drawn in by that narcissist and they're suggestible to all of the things that we've spoken about before, but also other narcissists because what's, what, does, what appeals to you? Being told that you're special. What appeals to you? The ability to then go and control people by using this organization. So empathic people go into religions because... They believe in it and they see it as a, a proper way to conduct your life. And fundamentally, most religions are based upon living your life in a particularly uh, righteous way and about uh, serving somebody in some shape or form, whether it's some form of deity or whether it's other human beings. So it's about the giving, which appeals to an empathic person. To the narcissist, religion, whether organized or cult, is such a huge draw because it's one of the most powerful tools that can exist for controlling other people. So even though you as the narcissist are being controlled by the cult, your narcissism sees it as an advantage to join the club because you then have the backing of the club to cause you to go out and uh, control other people. But, you know, what better way than saying, yeah. if you don't do this, you're going to burn in a lake of hell for all eternity. Oh, well, I better do what you say then. Uh, great. I've got I've got religion or the cult or whatever it is backing me up from behind. I'm exactly. Thinking, you know, I've got saints and apostles and all the rest of it. Exactly. That I can utilize. So the cult is started. You look at any cult that exists. And there will always be a narcissist as a cult leader. Exactly. Always. You couldn't have an empath or a normal be a cult leader, could you? No, they, they couldn't because it wouldn't sit with them to control people in the way through the telling of lies. And their conscience would kick in if they were yeah. doing such. But they would never start it. They can be drawn into one, exactly. of course, because of the yeah. susceptibility of the addiction, etc. in the way that lots of people uh, are drawn into organized religion. And invariably don't suffer any harm and they 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 you know they go to the church coffee mornings and they go and worship and it fulfills them so i'm not suggesting that it's necessarily a bad thing for many people it is a, it is a good thing but we all know of course the downside of these organizations in yeah. terms of how many wars and conflicts have gone on throughout history that were generated by religion the abuse that has taken place within uh, churches of children etc and so the fact is that the formation, so that the person that founded a church or founded a cult or founded a religion never will be an empath. Never. It will always be uh, a narcissist because it's, a, because it's such a brilliant method of control. Yep. And since the majority of people are not narcissists, it'll be hard for them to suss manipulation on such a big scale. That's what fucked me up about Hubbard. When I look back at his policies now, they're all about control. But those policies of control, how to control other people, how to be controlled, seem very powerful and heady 
and electrifying because he was so confident. There was, um, you know, on the way he'd write was pretty powerful. I had no idea he was the opposite. He was such an incredible liar. That's another point to get across is that good narcissists like you and, and, and Hubbard, they're just absolutely professional liars. So I think it was Goebbels or Hitler that said, you know, the famous line, make Mm -hmm. the lie big, make it simple, keep repeating it. And eventually the people will believe it. And I think the reason that works is because like I said, most people are not able to suss the scale of lie that somebody like you would actually tell. So the whole life can be a facade, but it can be so professionally acted out and so convincing and all encompassing that I never occurred to me that Hubbard was this horrible, contradictory liar. I believed every word that he wrote, not least because that narcissism gave him a sense of confidence that I had never seen before. You know what I mean? are such a convenient tool and also because they tap into this uh, very essential part of the human condition. Most human beings operate on the basis of trust. Yeah. They, do, they do not cross-examine people as their bona fides because if they did, everything would slow down and nothing really would get done. If you meet somebody and they go, oh, hello, Doug, I really like that shirt you're wearing. And you go, do you? Give me five reasons why you like this shirt. They go, <laughs> Doug, you're being an asshole. So you might lose that friendship. Or So you, you just accept that their compliment is genuine. Yeah. And you that's... Have on the basis of trust. Now, they might have been saying, hey, Doug, I like that shirt. And actually, they don't. But you don't realize. And okay, it's a harmless lie in the scheme of things. But the point is that human beings operate on the basis of trust in their interactions exactly. so that when you are told something your first response isn't immediately to go hmm is that true is that accurate but rather oh right okay i accept that and then of course certain things fit within the expectation of the world that you have been conditioned to expect right that it accords with a worldview that has been created and then all that needs to be done is ensure that the lie that you're told has some essence of credibility. And most people, and particularly when it comes from a position of authority, and it is, mm-hmm. as you just said, repeated often enough, and it is said with conviction, and those narcissists are true believers. Hitler, Hitler, for example, Stalin, they were true believers. Hitler mm-hmm. didn't think, yeah, I'll come up with this, um, this idea to uh, have the master race, but I don't really believe in it. It's just a bit of a laugh. He truly believed it. Yeah. And... He believed that the Rus and the Slavs, etc., were subhuman. So therefore, they were treated uh, uh, horribly. He didn't think, well, actually, there's not a lot wrong with them, but I'll pick on them anyway because it's a good laugh. It was simply he truly believed that. So when there is that true belief in that lie, which is to say to people that this, the, this section of humanity is inferior to us, yeah. and, of course, you know, the Jews... Uh, experience that they repeatedly scapegoats through history mm-hmm. and it's a common manipulative tactic you want to get people on side let's create a common enemy exactly and of course that's what cults do you know we looked at the outside world i'm not going to say the word for it because it means the n-word and i don't want to repeat it but we had every cult has a explanation as to why it's us versus them and mm-hmm. then they usually have a denigrating word as to what those other people are So I knew that anybody that didn't have their reactive mind removed via Scientology was a danger to society and to themselves. So now it became us versus them. My world got smaller and smaller. And it took me a long time to realize that the outside world wasn't evil and dangerous, like was inculcated into my mind. It's very interesting how that works. And like you said, as soon as you create a common enemy, it also creates an electricity within the group and gives them something even more to work towards about how to eliminate and or convert all the people that aren't yet members of of said cult, right? And then also, the cult will play into one of the most powerful psychological tools that exist, the herd mentality. Yeah, exactly. So everybody's saying, Scientology is great, and they all look happy, and they're all espousing the virtues Mm -hmm. of it. And even if you were thinking to yourself, my, this is all a bit sus, you would doubt yourself, because all these people are really good. In the same way that if you were walking down the street and you knew that where you'd come from was it was there was some kind of peril or hazard, but everybody else was going towards that, you would stop for a minute and think, am I doing the right thing here? Even though you've just witnessed the very peril 
behind you and you're moving away from it, the fact that everybody's going in that direction it would cause you to question yourself. Yep. And you might even turn around and start thinking, perhaps I've missed something here. Perhaps there's something even worse in that direction. Yeah. And so that herd mentality is hugely powerful. And cults utilize that. And narcissists, particularly aware narcissists, know about the power of that. And that's why we yeah, utilize okay. lieutenants and coterie members, because the more people that keep saying to you, this is great, you're going to think, yeah, well, if everybody else is saying it, it must be. Listening to you talk throughout this whole interview, you're just giving me the idea that no wonder um, the narcissist has a quote unquote advantage in, in all these, because of these very tools you're describing. It's almost like the way we're built as humans, the herd mentality, needing to be a part of a tribe. These are, and I, and I take your point about why you, you would say it's better to be a narcissist, to not have the emotions, to not, to be able to get things done, because it does seem like those that aren't that, and I'm not encouraging people to be HG, but I'm just saying, I can see the advantage that the mm -hmm. natural way humans work could be used to, for one person to take over a large group of people, which has happened all throughout history. And that, that herd mentality you talk about is so important and another advantage, quote unquote, that you guys have, because you just described the Ash conformity test, I believe it's called, where they have a guy sitting in a classroom and mm -hmm. they have all these different sticks, different sizes. And there's one guy that's the subject and then everybody else is in on it and they all pick you know they say which one's the smaller one and clearly they're picking the wrong one but after yes. a while because of the group mentality they'll automatically start to doubt themselves it's almost like yeah. being gaslit and they yeah. will go along unless you're a really strong person to do that and also with the, with the authority thing you're talking about too you just put on a lab coat and pretend like you're an authority and 80 percent of people were will bow down according to the uh, milgram experiment i believe where they were mm -hmm. telling people you know a guy in a lab coat was saying now shock this guy and the shocks would yeah. get higher and higher and up to and in killing, killing the person. I mean, it was all a staged thing. Uh, what was it? 70 or 80% freaking went up to a lethal dose. So you can't yeah. underestimate the herd mentality and putting on a lab coat and pretending to be in a position of authority, even if you're not. Yeah. And those, so the, as I, as I've mentioned, the use of lieutenants and coterie create that herd mentality right. and that many narcissists, not all, but many narcissists adopt that authoritative stance, either just simply exactly. in the relationship, I know better than you, and saying things with such conviction, because we're black and white about things. No, that's rubbish. Yes, that's that's absolutely brilliant. And because da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. Whereas an empathic person operates in shades of gray. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can kind of see why that's good, but also that there's some problems with it as well. So, yeah, I can sort of see both sides of the argument. That's why empathic people don't tend to make good politicians uh, in the sense of um, climbing the slippery, the greasy pole, because they can see the pros and cons of the argument so that they go, yeah, OK, uh, I understand why there are, there are difficulties with this. Whereas the narcissist that's a politician, they're absolutely right. And you know, you, your suggestion is utter nonsense i reject it I, I i reject it completely and even if you keep saying to them but the evidence shows that we all, your suggestion is lacks merit don't be ridiculous and then they'll just deflect and talk about something else and as we all know they never answer the question because the narcissism aids them in that way and you'd be sat there thinking to yourself surely you must know he's talking absolute bollocks here no he doesn't his narcissism convinces him that he's right and that yeah. enables him to back down anything that's said and climb that greasy pole it's so true. If I was more narcissistic or if I didn't wake up from the cult and have my, you know, kind of heart open up again, I got to tell you the kind of things that were necessary to, to succeed in Hollywood. I watched my mates who had a little less empathy or whatever rise to the top because there's no limits on, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about casting couch shit here. I'm just talking about their belief in themselves and not letting their conscience or anything get in the way to easily yeah. step over other people to get that yeah. part or whatever. And I, I could never do that. Even when I was in Scientology, I couldn't, exactly. so I tried instance, to go to the parties and mingle just none. All of yeah. that's a turnoff. I just you, wanted to be a good artist. That's right. So the narcissist would have, has no shame about marching into the drinks party none. and going up to the, the, the main producer there. And exactly. Going, oh, and I couldn't do that. Whereas you'd I be know. thinking, well, no, that would be rude that I would introduce myself that way. And I uh, wish I could do what they what they did because I knew I wasn't getting ahead that way. And it took me the long route. I, I was a little bit jealous that they could do that, but I couldn't even force myself to do it. I tried, man, even with yeah. the Scientology. It wasn't my style and I always felt gross doing it. But other people, especially narcissists, not only didn't have a problem with that, it helped their career. Absolutely. Well, you 
make a valid point when you say you feel gross about it. There are some people who manage to swallow that down and deal with their discomfort because they ultimately yeah. say, well, in order to get this gig, I'm going to have to True. find out my discomfort of being a bit pushy. But for exactly. an narcissist, there's no such consideration. That that role is mine. This guy's going to give it me, so I'm going to walk over and now talk to them. And, 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 and sometimes it's not even thinking in such terms. It's just immediately, I'm here. Yes. And over they go, and they immediately go, great to see you, etc. Yep. I've seen so many of those people, HG. You just reminded me of that, that Russian girl, which kind of led me to your work. She had no problem going up to the producers and right away using her sex appeal and bam, you know, she did, she did quite well. I'm sitting in the corner going, Jesus Christ, that's a little bit much, isn't it? Yeah. And these, oh, are man. The people, mm -hmm. these are the people that will jump a queue without any, without yeah. any problems doing so. They'll sharpen their elbows and shove in front of other people. They will, they will do things to cause you to fuck up your lines so that they can take advantage. Exactly. They, you know, they won't remind you of an appointment because then they can take advantage of it. Whereas you would always think, well, no, um, it, it's fair that this person was ahead of me. I'll let them, I'll let them go before me. But my kind, none of those considerations are there. No boundary recognition, the sense of entitlement, no accountability for the behaviours, and it all lends itself to getting ahead. And, and of course, these particular industries are ones where the churn and burn is so great, you've mm -hmm. almost got to be that way to survive. It's it. true. You keep your head it's above true. water. Politics, the entertainment industry uh, are two very notable areas in that respect. It's so true what you say, and it's being fully aware of that in the last few years that makes me, I, it'd be kind of hard to even go back into that. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess, we, so we've been going on an hour. I guess it's an excellent place to end it. And then we'll pick sure. up the, um, this has been so fascinating, HG. Every time we talk, you, uh, you not only help me personally, but I know the listeners are going to get something out of this too, because we're not just talking about cults or Scientology. It's very all-encompassing, all the things that we hit on today. Absolutely. Can I ask you one final question to kind of pinpoint to hit on the end of this? And then we'll pick up the immersion on the next one because we, we have more to go on that, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so would a narcissist, uh, we've been talking about cults and stuff, would they be less likely to be vulnerable to a cult initially and generally speaking? Uh, meaning I felt like I was vulnerable because... I'm mean, Scientology pushes the help button. And what that means is they have a way of weeding out. Do you like to help or not? Right. It's trying to mm -hmm. suss if you're going to, you know, be uh, somebody that they want or not. And generally speaking, they want people that will help because they'll, the, they're the ones that will feel guilt. They'll push the hardest and they'll never give up and they can easily be manipulated. Would a narcissist and or a dickhead have more of a protection against said manipulation or is that not true? It's a yes and no answer based upon the type of narcissist. So certain narcissists would be like, um, you don't tell me what to do mm -hmm. because they would perceive this, hey, do you like to help people as a threat to their control because they don't operate on the basis of being helpful. So their narcissism would reject it and therefore it would be harder to draw them in. A different type of narcissist that operates a facade of helpfulness, mid-range narcissists, oh yeah, I'm a really kind and helpful person. This is right up my alley. And what often happens, of course, is that that's why with certain narcissists, they get drawn together. Because you, some people will think, oh, you know, two narcissists, how could they ever coexist? But remember, what they, the cult is showing that it, it purportedly cares about the narcissist. The narcissist then is misled by thinking, hey, this cult wants me. This cult believes in me. This cult thinks that I'm going to be useful. Uh, although, of course, they're not seeing it as a cult. Yeah. And at the same time, the, that narcissist thinks, well, I can be helpful. And the narcissism is doing that to enable the narcissist to try and manipulate the, the cult member that's recruiting them. So this is why you get two narcissists almost appear to fall in love with one another, because they are both showing to the other individual the thing that the other individual is trying to hunt down and receive. So basically, they both portray themselves as fake empaths. Interesting. And thus there is the attractor. So some narcissists would reject it out of hand because their narcissism would see it as a direct threat to control. Others would see it as something that they could harness and bolt themselves onto uh, for the purposes of the pursuit of the prime aim. So it depends upon the subschool of narcissists, though. 
That's fantastic. And you just reminded me of what we talked about in the part one of the seduction when we talked about my parents, how it may very well be when two narcissists collide and how that's possible and what they would be. That explains actually the dynamics so well. I really appreciate you coming on again, HG. And to the audience, if you're on HG's channel, um, well, then you'll obviously be watching this video. If you're on my channel, Days But Not Confused, all the information that he's about to describe about the services he offers, where his YouTube channel is, etc., all that is in the description box of every video we do uh, on my channel. So before we end off, as usual, could you please tell people what services you offer and whatever else you'd like to say and where they can find you? Okay, thanks, Doug. There's a wealth of material that I provide. You can read it at my blog, narcsite.com. You can watch it at my YouTube channel, which is Knowing the Narcissist, HG Church of the Ultra. Uh, Those works also appear on my platforms on Instagram, on Twitter, and Facebook. If you want to know if you're dealing with a narcissist, you can book a narc detector consultation with me through my blog. If you want to know what you are, are you an empath? Are you narcissistic? Are you a normal? You can do the empath detector. If you want to talk to me, but you want me to help you out with the situation that you find yourself in, or you want to pick my brains for understanding about narcissism, book an audio consultation with me. Again, all of those links are in the menu bar at narcsite.com. Thank you so much. And as usual, you're just such a wealth of knowledge. And I know that you're not, you're doing it for your own benefit, but man, the dichotomy is amazing to witness because you probably help more people than, uh, than an empath that's out there trying to do the same thing. Because, you know, audience, this guy's giving us insight. This is what really penetrated with HG. And I think what a lot of people respond to in his work specifically is that you get the straight dope and it also penetrates emotionally, which is what I personally needed. Not a bunch of theory and like this, that, and the other thing, but we're getting the inside scoop of how a narcissist really thinks. And how would you really know that? Unless you had someone like a self-aware narcissist that not only would spill the beans, but be able to articulate it, let alone even being aware that that's what he is. That's why I really like this guy, man. I think he's just kind of a a unique person to learn from and possibly the most penetrating if you really want to get to the nitty gritty of what the hell's going on in your life. If you suffer from one of these invisible creatures in and around you. So thanks again, uh, HG. And um, I really, really look forward to talking to you the next time. Absolutely. Look forward to it also. Thank you, Doug. Take care, my friend.